Hello, everybody, and welcome. Um, today, we are going to delve into a whole slew of topics, 8.3, 8.7, 8.8, and then 8.12, 13, and 14. I know that sounds like a lot, but they're all interrelated uh, in dealing with toxicity and uh, impacts of certain pollutants on the health of humans and other organisms. So that's why we're throwing them all into one bunch. All right, so first of all, Pollution and human health. Um, some important things to understand. One of them being that cause and effect relationships between specific pollutants and specific health impacts can often be difficult. Uh, mostly um, because the symptoms might mimic other diseases that can occur completely naturally. Right, um, and because humans and other organisms are exposed to all kinds of different chemicals and pollutants on a fairly regular basis, so it's uh, sometimes hard to assess or uh, identify a specific source. All right, so for example, something like mesothelioma um, is a type of lung cancer. Now, mesothelioma can occur perfectly naturally. Um, without any specific exposure to a toxin or pollutant, right? However, it's also uh, very often associated with exposure to things like asbestos, which we learned about as an indoor air pollutant uh, in Unit 7, right? Now, things like dysentery, on the other hand, um, basically it is a disease, um, uh, basically bacterial or a parasite uh, or a um, paramecium or something like that, uh, can get into the GI tract of people and cause all kinds of GI distress and uh, so sometimes death, uh, depending on how severe it is or whether it gets treated, right? Um, that is almost always associated with untreated sewage pollution, right? So sometimes we can identify a specific uh, cause and effect relationship almost right away. Other times uh, it can be more difficult. All right. Now, um, toxicology, right, is the study of the effect of toxicants on the human body. All right. So toxicant would be some sort of uh, potent labeled as toxic. All right. Now, uh, we can have toxic impacts that we describe as acute. All right. And basically, that just means that we have a single, often one time uh, or a large exposure to a specific toxic toxin or pollutant, right? And that causes a response to occur almost immediately. And those are easier to assess and identify, by the way. Uh, contrast that with more of a chronic toxicity, which basically uh, occurs after prolonged or long-term exposure, often to lower dosages or lower amounts. Um, but, and that's a little bit more difficult to assess because it often, again, like we said before, mimics uh, other illnesses. All right, so let's talk about some different types of pollutants and toxins out there that the College Board wants you to be aware of, what they are, what their sources are, what their impacts are. So we'll start with what are called endocrine disruptors. Now, uh, depending on how much anatomy and physiology you guys have had, uh, you may or may not know what the endocrine system is. So we'll just define that briefly, although I'm sure most of you have heard of it at some point. But the endocrine system is... Uh, basically your system of glands, your thyroid gland, uh, your, your sexual reproductive organ, organs and things like that, right? Uh, but basically what they do is they control the production of hormones. Hormones are like messengers um, and help regulate things like sexual reproduction, growth and development, your learning ability and behavior, all right? So all these glands work together to produce certain hormones, hormones, increase and decrease over time to regulate all kinds of body systems, all right? So endocrine disruptors uh, are referring to the variety of chemicals that can get in and wreak havoc on your endocrine system uh, when they get up to certain levels, right? So some chemicals can kind of mimic uh, certain hormones or can block the production or the uh, the uh, adherence to certain hormones, right? Um, and in doing so, 
uh, can cause disruptions to those functions we just talked about. So, for example, uh, sources of endocrine disruptors would be certain herbicides and pesticides, which is why it's extremely important to uh, always wash your fresh produce, all right? Uh, two, what are called dioxins. Dioxins are byproducts um, from certain industrial chemicals. Uh, lead and mercury, as we talked about uh, earlier this year on several occasions. Um, and BPA, bisphenol A, uh, it's a chemical found in many plastics. All right. So uh, some of the potential impacts um, and uh, identified and Verified impacts, uh, in some cases, they can be reduced testosterone production or estrogen uh, production in some cases, right? Uh, we can have potential birth defects and developmental disorders. Um, and now in certain fish and amphibian species uh, who uh, spend their uh, much or all of their life in water, there's even been a cause of uh, gender imbalances. For example, uh, far more females compared to males. All right. So, uh, by the way, the textbook has a pretty cool little uh, graphic here. Um, you guys should read that textbook, by the way. But um, you can reduce your exposure to uh, certain hormones by uh, doing lots of these following, right? So, since herbicides and pesticides uh, are associated with a lot of our endocrine disruptors, if you eat certified organic produce and meats, uh, they are not allowed to use those synthetic fertilizers and pesticides, and therefore you could limit your exposure. Um, I would highly, highly recommend uh, making sure that when you have plastic packaging that it is BPA-free. I believe pretty much all packaging that you would get at the grocery store, for example, that is plastic is in fact BPA-free. But I would uh, it's probably okay to store your food in plastic. Um, However, I would never heat my food in a plastic container. Uh, I would always just take it out of the container and put it into a glass or ceramic bowl that's microwave safe. All right. Uh, also avoiding like, uh, uh, you know, chemical air fresheners and things like that is helpful. All right. Now, there's other types of compounds that are referred to as persistent organic pollutants. By the way, organic uh, in this context, it's not referring to organic agriculture, in which case they would not use uh, hormones or antibiotics or synthetic fertilizers or synthetic pesticides. All right. Organic is in the chemistry context, which just simply means it's composed of carbon, hydrogen, and often a couple other elements. But carbon, hydrogen combined makes something an organic molecule, right? So organic molecules that do not breakdown in nature, sometimes referred to as forever chemicals, right? So basically, once they're out in nature, nature has no uh, systems in place to break those back down into simpler materials, hence the term forever chemicals, all right? Uh, so the most common examples of POPs, or per persistent organic pollutants, are PCBs, polychlorinated biphenyls, and DDT. Now, both of those substances, by the way, have been banned in the U.S. Uh, uh, as early as like the late 1970s, I believe, uh, because of some of the uh, harmful effects they began noticing uh, in them, even though they seemed relatively safe uh, at first glance, all right? Now, the reason persistent organic pollutants uh, tend to get labeled as particularly problematic is uh, they are often um, soluble in fat, right? Uh, and so what can happen is they can begin to accumulate or bioaccumulate in fatty tissues. And I know that my students have, uh, we've defined that term bioaccumulate before. We're going to refer to it one more time just to refresh our memories. So bioaccumulation is basically the selective absorption and accumulation of elements or compounds, right? And again, usually in like in the fatty tissues of an organism, right? So DDT, PCBs, and mercury are three examples of uh, substances that can bioaccumulate, okay? Um, now, through bioaccumulation, remember what's happening is the amount of a particular substance, be it toxic or not, increases within the organism um, to a level higher than would be found out in nature. Okay, now if we then take that process of bioaccumulation and work our way up the food chain, we get to what's called bio 
magnification. And that's what we're seeing in this inverted pyramid here, right? So DDT, in the case of this particular um, graphic, could be in extremely small quantities in the water, right? But by the time we get up to higher level consumers, it can increase uh, orders of magnitude higher to where it does become problematic. All right. So uh, some effects that occur in nature due to bioaccumulation are uh, eggshell thinning. So that was, uh, again, bald eagle populations. Part of the reason they originally had trouble recovering was because of bioaccumulation and biomagnification of DDT. So Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, documents that out in nature. All right. Uh, now, in humans, that can cause reproductive, nervous, and circulatory system issues, uh, again, particularly as we look at the impacts of mercury uh, as we work our way up the food chain. All right. Now, toxicity, also something that we've addressed a little bit in this class already, uh, is uh, toxicity. So we've talked about LD50 and ED50 both already, but let's just refer to them one more time. So ED50 is referring to the effective dose to 50% of the test organisms, all right? And it is important that we understand that these uh, levels are found in control conditions in isolation without maybe added effects of other toxins, okay? But ED50 is just referring to uh, the dosage um, required uh, to exhibit whatever effect is being studied in that case, right? Now, LD50 that we did talk about earlier this year, it's just referring, it's basically ED50, but referring specifically to the lethal dosage. So the the, the uh, effect they'd be looking for that in that case is death, right? So what dosage is required to uh, kill 50% of the test population in isolation, right? That is the LD50 dosage. ED50 might be looking at other impacts, uh, either positive or negative, sort of depends, right? This table over here, uh, has uh, some values here. And one of the things to remember is that the smaller the LD50 value, the more toxic it is. That just means it takes less to have those lethal impacts, right? So of the substances listed on this table, strychnine be most toxic. All right. Uh, and then decreasing as we work our way up. So you guys can see that nicotine right? It's actually significantly more toxic than even things like heroin. Of course, the amount of nicotine in uh, tobacco is so extremely small that it doesn't have the same impacts. It does not mean that heroin is better than smoking. That's not at all what I'm saying. I'm just saying that the compound nicotine has a higher toxicity on a per gram or per milligram basis than uh, something like heroin does. All right? But again, the amount of nicotine in something like uh, chewing tobacco or other tobacco products is extremely small, nowhere, nowhere near that lethal dosage level. All right. Now, last but not least, we've looked at these dose response curves before, but let's take one last look, right? Some important things we want to be able to look at is identifying either the ED50 or LD50 level, right? Uh, so typically, we would find that by looking at the percent of populations showing the response, right? If the response was death, right? That would be LD50. If there was some other response, we would just say ED50 level. And again, all we do is we look for that 50% line. We track it over to where it intersects our data curve, right? And then if our dosage is on the uh, x-axis, we can identify that ED50 or LD50 dosage, all right? So uh, threshold level referring to the maximum level at which there is no effect at all. All right, that is it. I will see you guys in class.